started well before I decided to join the fraternity and my interest in this subject was part of the reason I joined. Uh, at some point you have to kind of get some experiential uh, knowledge of the subject uh, because you exhaust what you can find in, in books. And my All right, so this evening we're going to, uh, I'll do my best, I should say, to uh, touch upon the history of Freemasonry. Um, I want to give you uh, kind of my history and disclaimer here as well. So I should say, just so you understand for the purposes of disclosure, so you know where I'm coming from, that I am a Mason, uh, and I'm an active one, a member of several lodges here in the Dallas Metroplex, a member of one of the lodges in Oklahoma as well, uh, and especially an active Scottish Rite Mason. Um, in both the organization in Dallas and the one in Guthrie, Oklahoma. Uh, and I'm a York Rite Mason and many other sort of Masonic organizations as well. But my principal responsibility tends toward uh, the responsibility of education uh, within the, the Masonic fraternity. My chief personal historic interest is actually the history and development and evolution of the Masonic degrees themselves and the symbolism and how that evolved and where it came from. And, and how it was interpreted in various ways. That's my specialty. Um, but tonight we're gonna, we're gonna approach just the general history of Freemasonry. And that's a bit, you know, that's a very deep rabbit hole. And, and really the best I can do is sort of trace the outline of the hole because I know I've got some of you in this room that have already jumped in the hole and I've got some of you that have never seen the white rabbit yet. And I'll do my best, I promise. And, and, and we've got time for questions and answers, so I'm happy to go as deep as you want uh, by the time we get there, and I will do my best to answer what I can, and if I don't know the answer, I promise you'll be, you'll be the first to hear it from me. Um, now, I recognize the more conspiracy-minded of you, too, uh, may see this, the fact that I'm a Mason as a way to dismiss everything that I'm gonna say tonight. Um, I'm going to address intentionally some of the more well-known controversies and conspiracies. Uh, but again, if you want to address that in the questions and answers, I'm, I'll, I'll, I'll do my best, I promise. I've been studying the history and symbolism of Freemasonry for about 20 years, a little longer. And I've been a Mason for probably 11 or 12 years, so I started well before I decided to join the fraternity. And my interest in this subject was part of the reason I joined. Uh, at some point, you have to kind of get some experiential uh, knowledge of the subject uh, because you exhaust what you can find in in books and my main function in education a lot of what I do uh, for other Masons is to correct some of their uh, misconceptions about the history of their own fraternity uh, so uh, because it can be really hard to separate fact from legend uh, and myth when it comes to Freemasonry and that's true even if you're a Mason so again uh, I'll do my best for what really is a vast, a vast subject. The other thing I want to emphasize before I begin is that no one speaks officially on behalf of Freemasonry uh, as a whole, least of all me. Uh, you, you know, you will talk as we go tonight a little bit about why such a thing would even be impossible, uh, but, but this evening you're going to, regardless, get my perspective, and mine is not the only one. Of course, much of what I discuss tonight is going to be history that's documented, and I have a very rigid uh, and conservative approach to the way I understand history, so my, my hope is that the source material and the information that you get tonight you'll find to be uh, accurate and, and as transparent as possible. And where there is speculation or just opinion, I'll, I'll make that clear as well. So before we set out on this subject, I've got to, I've got to deal with the question of what is Freemasonry because if you watch the History Channel uh, or the Discovery Channel or you read some of the books that out, are out there, it would be very difficult to understand the answer to that question, what is Freemasonry? In a lot of ways, modern Freemasonry functions like any other civic or social organization. It's a fraternity, so it has social aspects where you get to know uh, people from all different walks of life, different backgrounds, and you can establish friendships that are lasting uh, and meaningful. You, see, you, see, you meet people from other countries, people of different faiths, uh, different socioeconomic backgrounds, different levels of education uh, and interests. You meet uh, people from other generations who are both older and younger than you, and it's a way of learning about uh, 
uh, or a great deal about uh, life through the experiences that are shared uh, by others. Now, Freemasonry is united for at least a few common purposes, and I'll get to three of those key ones in a minute. Um, but it's also a charitable organization, it has many charitable purposes. Um, most of you will be familiar uh, with that probably most likely through bodies like the Scottish Rite who run the, the Scottish Rite Hospital for Children here in Dallas, uh, the Shrine, for example, all of whom are Masons, the Shriners uh, run a number of children's hospitals uh, all over uh, the place uh, and burn centers and so on. And so Masons uh, do invest a lot of time and energy uh, and effort in supporting charitable works. However, one thing that distinguishes Freemasonry from other civic organizations besides its age, its antiquity, uh, so to speak, uh, are what's known as its degrees. And the degrees of Masonry would be best be thought of as uh, plays or dramas or ceremonies that provide a candidate or a new member an initiatic experience. Now, what's an initiatic experience? And what's the role of initiation? Now we have some of these uh, uh, initiations in our culture today, some formal, some informal. Uh, for example, acceptance uh, to a group. You might, you might have some sort of ceremony that recognizes that someone has become a member uh, of any organization, uh, civic or otherwise. There may be a recognition of a milestone, uh, like a graduation ceremony, when we recognize that all the students that are walking that stage have gone through all of the work necessary to earn their diploma or to get their college degrees or their graduate degrees. It might be you have an initiatic experience that marks some sort of beginning of a journey uh, or undertaking. Um, you know, that journey may be involved personal growth or self-knowledge or self-improvement. Some of the informal ones would be like when you get your first car, maybe when you take your first drink. You know, that's not the best uh, sort of ethical example, perhaps, or the best example of adulthood. Uh, but yet we kind of take that as an informal initiatic experience, an informal milestone that marks where we are in life. In part, this is based upon the idea in masonry uh, that we make the world a better place by making ourselves better people. So the function of initiation in masonry is to offer you an opportunity uh, for further self-knowledge and self-improvement. This is tied uh, explicitly to the ethic of human progress that arose to prominence, particularly in Europe in the 1700s during the Age of an Enlightenment. It, during the Age of Enlightenment, it was understood for the first time that humanity as a whole, through its own acquisition of knowledge and understanding and insight and experience, could improve, that conditions of life could be made better, that there were better forms of government, you know, better ways of, of working uh, as communities uh, uh, and, and better ways of treating our fellow man. So the experience of masonry is really centered around these degrees. And in particular, uh, every mason uh, goes through three of them. Now, who are Freemasons? Well, we have a few requirements to become a mason and that goes well back into history, but they're very simple. One very important one is that you have to seek to be a mason of your own free will. No one is ever gonna invite you, we don't do that. Uh, no one's gonna ask you to join, no one's gonna pressure you to join for any reason. You've got to, for whatever your own personal reason, actually ask to become one. And the second one, and this is key, is you must be able to express some sort of belief in deity. That means you have to have a spiritual viewpoint. And we don't ask any other questions. We don't ask you to define that. We don't ask you to clarify. And there's no tests of even what you mean by that. That's largely because sectarian and partisan religious and political discussion are not allowed uh, within Masonic lodges or during their meetings for the simple reason that it's divisive. And the general ethic of Freemasonry uh, is, is unity, is to avoid that divisiveness and to see what we accomplish together. Because it rises from a period of time in Europe when for hundreds of years people had been killing each other over religious and political differences. To express this, I'll give you a quote from Anderson's Constitutions of 1723. Now this is Reverend James Anderson. He was a minister of the Church of Scotland. He was born in Aberdeen. Uh, in 1680, and we'll get into the Grand Lodge histories here in a little bit, but in 1721, he's commissioned by the Grand Lodge of England, or it was Grand Lodge of London at the time, to write a history of the Freemasons, and that was to include a kind of a rough guideline or set of rules uh, 
uh, of conduct and how to conduct business uh, as Masons. The 1723 edition, Anderson says this, a Mason is obliged by his tenure to obey the moral law. And if he rightly understands the art, he will never be a stupid atheist nor an irreligious libertine. But though in ancient times, Masons were charged in every country to be of the religion of that country or nation, whatever it was, tis now thought more expedient only to oblige them to that religion in which all men agree, their particular opinions to themselves, that is, to be good men and true, men of honor and of honesty. So here in 1723, you see that ethic of our religious differences are set aside. And in 1723 in Europe, England or otherwise, I promise you that is a radical idea. Now I mentioned some of the, the uniting purposes among Masons, and I wanna give you a taste of some of the language that a new Mason hears uh, when he becomes an apprentice in a lodge for the first time. There's three principal tenets associated with Masonry. They're brotherly love, relief, uh, and truth. And I'll give you some of the Entered Apprentice Masons lecture. By the exercise of brotherly love, we are taught to regard the whole human species as one family, the high and low, the rich and poor, who is created by one almighty parent and inhabitants of the same planet are to aid, support, and protect each other. On this principle, masonry unites men of every country, sect, and opinion and conciliates true friendship among those who might otherwise have remained at a perpetual distance. So this teaching and the lecture is a basis for tolerance, for patience, for understanding. In terms of relief, by relief, Masons mean charity. The lecture says to relieve the distressed is a duty incumbent upon all men, but particularly on Masons, who are linked together by an indissoluble chain of sincere affection, to soothe the unhappy, to sympathize with their misfortunes, to compassionate their miseries and to restore peace to their troubled minds is the grand aim we have in view. So it's worthwhile for you and I to join or unite in trying to help our fellow man because we can accomplish more together than we can alone. It teaches humility, compassion, and it teaches that we have the power to improve the world around us. It's optimistic. And truth, the apprentice lecture says, truth is a divine attribute and the foundation of every virtue. To be good and true is the first lesson we are taught in masonry. On this theme we contemplate, and by its dictates endeavor to regulate our conduct. Hence, while influenced by this principle, hypocrisy and deceit are unknown among us. Sincerity and plain dealing distinguish us, and the heart and tongue join in promoting each other's welfare and rejoicing in each other's prosperity. So we have integrity, we have uh, the importance of the intellect, and reason. This part of the lecture suggests that we truly reflect upon our actions and explore the core values and beliefs we have and then follow those with sincerity and authenticity. Plain dealing. I, I mean, I still give those words uh, to a in, to brand new entered apprentices and lodges around the city today. Um, Another good question to answer before we dive into history is why all the symbolism? You see all of the, all of the old drawings and, and, uh, and these peculiar symbols and odd things that are associated with masonry. And the interesting thing is the use of these symbols is far older than really the, the idea that masons would be obsessed with secrecy about it. The question is why does Freemasonry use symbols? This is an example actually of an entered apprentice tracing board. So this is an old uh, English style uh, board that would go with uh, the, uh, the entered apprentice lecture, the, the lecture that the brand new apprentice would receive. The reason symbols are useful to masonry is because they're dynamic. Uh, their meaning and application grows and unfolds uh, with the person who's studying and reflecting upon them. Uh, I had an early reference at the beginning to Alice and the rabbit hole, uh, for example. Those of you who had the opportunity to read the book, say Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, for example, or Through the Looking Glass as a child and appreciated the story for the fantasy and for the strangeness of it. And then turn around as adults, perhaps as parents, 
you know, either reading that book to your children or experiencing it as your children read it again or reading it as again as adult, boy, there's a whole lot more meaning in that story now with a little bit of experience and understanding and knowledge in life than there was, than it then was there when you're eight or nine or 10 or 11 and so on. Symbols do that. You know, given time and application, a symbol just means more to you later in life than the first time you encounter it. And that means it continues to teach you long after you first heard about it. If masonry just used words, then there would be no opportunity for improvement uh, or progress, no new discovery. And all of those ideas are central to the enlightenment ethic I mentioned earlier. Symbols speak to us differently. You know, we, you might think in words, but you dream in images. Uh, there's a depth to them that requires introspection and thought. When, uh, you know, when you recall a fictional book, like Al, you know, Alice in Wonderland or another one, when you recall the book, do you think of the words that were read or do you think of the story uh, and the images in your mind when you read it? And we know that symbols teach very powerfully because we see them in all kinds of traditions where parables and fables, even our fairy tales and epic adventures are used to impart instruction that's useful for life. So having set a framework so you understand where I'm coming from and what I'm talking about, uh, what Freemasonry is, uh, we can start to deal with history. Where does Freemasonry come from? Now, I need to say first that even Freemasons can't put together a complete definitive history uh, of the tradition. And there's a lot of utter nonsense uh, out there among Masons and, and non-Masons. And part of the challenge is that historical evidence uh, makes it clear that Freemasonry grew and evolved organically over several centuries. There was no one uh, vision, no one purpose, no one author or leader uh, or creator. There's no group setting a specific agenda. Now, at times throughout history, there have been individuals or groups who have tried to exert influence on Masonic lodges. Those have invariably failed. We'll talk about a couple tonight. But more significantly, uh, to an extent, Freemasonry has always been changing. It's always been, become something a little different with each generation than it was before. So it's simply just not controlled. It grows organically. Nonetheless, there are all kinds of speculations about the origin of masonry. A lot of things are thrown out about the Knights Templar, uh, ancient Egypt, ancient Greece, Pythagoras, uh, or Euclid, some of the ancient philosophers, uh, Solomon, uh, for example, uh, Druids, Samaria, Persia, India. There are all kinds of theories. I've read lots about all of them, and I've heard them for, for two decades. I've had well-intended masons, in all seriousness, tell me that it goes back to the time of Abraham. Or, it goes, or Adam was the first Freemason. I've heard that. Um, but you ultimately have to unwind Freemasonry itself as a tradition and as an institution. You have to unwind the ideas and symbols which are far older than Freemasonry in many cases from the actual group of men that called themselves Freemasons and the institution that resulted. Those two things are not the same thing. Now, the best evidence we have, the best case I can offer you, uh, suggests that it pretty much begins in the form we have it in the Middle Ages uh, with the guilds that were practicing actual stone masonry. This, this brings up the subject of both guilds and confraternities. This is an engraving, by the way, from uh, Kai in France in a monastery, kind of depicting the, a stonemason at work there with a chisel uh, and a gavel. Now, what's a confraternity? Uh, these primarily exist from about the 13th century, especially in Europe. We're talking about the Middle Ages here. They're usually Christian and authorized by the church. Of course, in this time, that, that means the Roman Catholic Church. And they're lay membership. So they're not priests. They're not monks. They're not necessarily educated. They're lay members from the communities themselves. These are voluntary organizations. They promote perhaps special works uh, and charity. They assist with burials or the, you know, assist families with expenses in the time of death. And we're talking about a period of time where there is often a lot of death between epidemics and fires uh, and violence. And they're also responsible for organizing and preparing fest, uh, festivities associated with the holy days and the feast days within the church calendar. 
And that might involve putting on plays or mystery plays or, or, or shows or entertainment, uh, as well as providing uh, and preparing you know, food and the sorts of things like that. And time proves that these confraternities are far better at handling this than, than government, uh, especially at this time. And in terms of structure, confraternities had rules that would govern their membership, who was able to join and how they would join, and then what was the conduct expected of the member of the confraternity. Guilds, very similar in structure, but guilds are groups of artisans or merchants. They're not necessarily um, strictly uh, organized around a community of people who are religiously pious, though lay community members. Uh, the guilds are groups of artisans and merchants, and they're organized to control uh, the practice of their particular craft in their particular town uh, or region. And they're usually authorized under the local uh, regional government authority, the magistrate uh, or the mayor, and occasionally we'll mention a couple of times the king uh, or the monarchy. Now, the guilds had local officers, leaders, and representatives from within the trade. <clears throat> and they also existed in great numbers from the early 13th century, but especially uh, in the 14th century. And like confraternities, guilds had rules uh, of conduct. You know, who could be a member? How would they join? How would they learn the trade? Come in, be an apprentice, learn what they needed to know so they could work well and safely and be responsible on the job. And then how you would certify the fact that they had accomplished that and then the conduct that was expected of them uh, to be a good, upright, and moral representative of their trade, of their craft. <coughs> Excuse me. And the guilds would settle disputes. They would organize training and, the, and apprenticeships, as I've mentioned. And they also did charitable works and very frequently were responsible for taking care of the members of their trade when they were in distress. And that extends then to the community, and you see guilds also responsible for larger charitable works uh, within their communities, outside of just the members of the trade. Now, in terms of operative or practical stonemasons, masons who are working on stone, because I don't do that, masons who work on stone, we have a number of documents we call the old charges. The oldest one is, is the Hollywell manuscript, or sometimes it's called the Regius poem. The latest dating for that would be probably the early 15th century, so the early 1400s. It's a manuscript that's written as a poem. It's Middle English. It's a little bit of a challenge to read if you're not used to that. And it talks about this legendary history of Freemasonry and the organization of the craft, and it includes rules of conduct and expectations and so on. And it was probably written down about this time to magnify the reputation and legitimacy of the stonemason trade as something unique and special. This is about the time that stonemasons' lodges throughout Europe are seeking legitimacy and recognition and warrants or charters from the monarchy, which is higher, than, higher up the totem pole than a lot of guilds and trades and merchant, trade, uh, merchant guilds are able to accomplish. And the history that's, that's presented in this case is legendary. Uh, you know, it's an oral tradition. It, it, there's, no, there's no supporting evidence in terms of history for it, but it's a fascinating read. But what's important is even though we're talking about the early 14th century, there's language in that document that's still present in Masonic ceremony and lecture even today. Now, at this time that you had operative or masons working on stone uh, guilds, there were two very clear degrees that had practical purposes. You would be brought in as an apprentice. Your name would be entered into the role of the guild. I would call you an entered apprentice once your name was on that log. And then you would study, usually for a period of time around seven years. You would learn the trade. You would be partnered with a journeyman or a fellow of the craft, a fellow craft, uh, or even the master of the lodge to learn the trade. And then your work might be examined. You would perhaps prove yourself proficient as a stonemason, and then you would, you would be made a fellow of the craft. The modern word for that is fellow craft, and that marks you as someone who's fully qualified to work as a stonemason. And it's common for these trades, this is especially true with masonry, but it's not just true with stonemasonry. You have working tools associated with your craft. Masons have squares and levels and plums and gavels and chisels and setting malls and trowels and all kinds of tools they use. 
And as an apprentice, you would learn how to use those in an operative sense. But we know from the old charges in the 15th, 16th centuries that the stonemasons guilds and some of the other trades we know were doing this too, were also imparting moral instruction along with the tangible instruction of how to use a tool. You know, a level tells you if a stone is level. That's really important if it's the first stone laid in the foundation of a building or a cornerstone. If that one's not level, the whole building is going to be off, right? So that level is really important. So we see in the 16th and 17th century that stonemasons start to say things like, well, you know, that level, uh, that's an emblem of uprightness of conduct. You need to be as upright in your life as that stone is. And that level is the guide that's going to teach you how to do that. And so you start to see this merging of the idea that the mason himself, while he's learning to work on stone, is starting to work on himself as, as a stone for the purpose of creating a building. Now, I've used the word operative several times. I'm going to use a couple more accepted and speculative masonry. Up to this point, everything we're dealing with are masons, Middle Ages, early Renaissance, who are actually practicing stonemasonry. They're building things. We have two words that show up in the 1600s. The first is the word accepted. And an accepted mason, uh, and we can't say for sure why it started to happen. We can speculate. But an accepted mason was a mason who did not work on stone and would never work on stone in a practical sense but was going to be made a mason, made a apprentice and fellow craft of a lodge, perhaps initially as an honor. Probably early on, this was a lot, perhaps architects. We think some lodges in uh, Scotland and England would have invited patrons or aristocracy to become accepted masons within their lodges to share a little bit of their tradition. Again, furthering the idea that stonemasons as a trade are special among all the other trade guilds. We have a couple of significant ones that pop up a lot in Masonic history. Uh, Robert Moray was an accepted Mason. Uh, he was initiated May 20th, 1641. That's tomorrow, um, several hundred years ago, in London by a group of Scottish Masons uh, from Edinburgh. And Robert Moray was one of the founders of the Royal Society. He was a natural philosopher. He was an early scientist, a rationalist, a kind of a critical thinker, a very intelligent man. Elias Ashmole is another one. He's well known as the first English speculative mason because uh, Robert Moray was from Scotland. Elias Ashmole, June 1646, he was brought into a lodge. He was made an apprentice and fellow craft on the same night. He was also a founder of the Royal Society, a natural philosopher, and well known as an alchemist, mentioned a couple times in Harry Potter, you know, uh, as well as Nicholas Flamel. But these are early accepted masons, masons who were never going to work on stone. The other word that comes up is speculative. Speculative as opposed to operative. Operative stonemasonry is working physically on rocks, stones, buildings. And speculative is to speculate about other interpretations and meanings and applications of the lessons and the teachings and the working tools of masonry. And again, we can't say for certain and there probably wasn't one consistent reason, and it certainly wasn't in an organized fashion, where these accepted Masons started to come in. But we know that they were kind of universally speculative. The accepted Masons who came in because they weren't going to learn the practical instruction were most interested in the speculative interpretation of the working tools and the symbols of these lodges. And by June 24th in 1717, at the Goose and Gridiron Tavern in St. Paul's Churchyard, we have four lodges in London that get together and declare themselves a Grand Lodge. And they elect Anthony Sayer as their first Grand Master. As far as we can tell, the real purpose of the Grand Lodge was to organize festivities, to have a feast day on St. John's Day, a big party. And the responsibility of the Grand Master was to make sure that that happened and that it, and that it went down well. Now, it's not clear at first that there's any attempt by these lodges declaring themselves to be a Grand Lodge, that uh, there's no attempt to govern or organize Freemasonry at large. Now, there was already a presence of elder, older and larger lodges 
uh, issuing charters and organizing lodges in their area. The big one that you'll stumble on uh, in Masonic history is Kilwinning. We now call that Kilwinning number nothing uh, because it's as elite, it's, it's zero because it's earlier than the first. Uh, but it's a Scottish lodge and English masons aren't really thrilled with the idea that Scottish masonry is much older, but it is. Kilwinning number nothing is at least as old as 1598 and they have consistent continuous written minutes uh, back to 1642. And they were chartering other lodges as early as 1677. They issued a charter for, for a new lodge called Lodge Canongate Kilwinning. Now the Grand Lodge of London, established in 1717, begins to assert some organizational authority, charters other lodges in the area of London and around England. We have a similar formation of the Grand Lodge of Ireland in 1725. The English speaking lodges in France very early on, because they're Englishmen you know, abroad in France. Uh, they establish a lodge 1721 in Dunkirk. Uh, there's a French lodge meeting in London in 1723. The master there is uh, Jean de Seglier. We'll mention him again in a minute. And the Grand Lodge of France is established for the first time in 1728 with the Grand Master William Wharton, who's the first Duke of Warden. And in England and France at this time, you really start to see higher levels of the aristocracy start to assume prominent and leadership positions. Uh, in Freemasonry. The other trend is you see a lot of scientists and natural philosophers and free thinkers. You see the Grand Lodge of Scotland pops up in 1736. The Grand Lodge of London uh, becomes the Grand Lodge of England in 1738. So ambition growing a little bit for them. But in 1751, you have what's a group that styles itself the Ancient and Honorable Society of Free and Accepted Masons. It's established by about 80 Irish Masons in London who are unhappy with the authority that the Grand Lodge of England is trying to assert over lodges uh, in England. These are Irishmen, and there's a lot of nationalism and a lot of sort of prejudice against Scottish and Irish and some crowds of England at this time. And so they were probably disgruntled for any number of reasons. Most of them, if not all, were operative stonemasons from Ireland. And they style themselves as the ancients Grand Lodge of masonry. In other words, we're the real old one. And those guys, those startups in 1717, they call them the moderns. Now there really is no secession, there's no schism. Uh, there were principally, as I said, Irish masons. But nonetheless, the the disparity of the organization of the craft in England is a bit confused at the time because out of aggression and competition, the ancients and the moderns start chartering and organizing lodges in and around England. They ultimately reconcile on December 27th at St. John, the other St. John's Day in 1813 uh, after several years of negotiation. So that's where Grand Lodges start to pop up. And all of these Grand Lodges outside of Scotland and the initial ancients lodge in Ireland Everything else we see in England and France, London at this time, these are speculative, accepted masons. Not necessarily, and the new lodges created may have no operative masons at all. Now what really distinguishes the new lodges that are being created in the mid 1700s by these grand lodges is the third degree, the master's degree. Before this, I mentioned apprentice and fellow craft, right? Before the 1720s, there's really only one reference to master in a Masonic context, and that was the leader of the lodge, uh, or perhaps someone who had demonstrated a real mastery over uh, their craft. Their work was really good. By the 1720s, we start to see this thing called the master's degree. And the master's degree is different from the other two because it presents this very uniquely Masonic legend that's connected uh, with the construction of King Solomon's temple. And before this time, that story appears nowhere. And it's a mystery play. It's an allegory, not a history. There's a Trinity College manuscript in 1711, maybe, could be later, and it suggests the idea of this story of the master's degree with totally different characters. It actually has nothing to do with Solomon. It's about Noah and his three sons. But it's just a little snippet, and we can't be sure about the dating. But we know that we have the Graham, manu Graham manuscript in 1726, and that's the first indication of anything that looks similar to the story of the master's degree uh, as it's given today. Not much detail at all 
just the skeleton of a story, really. But at least the characters are right and the general tone of what's going on. You can tell that that's actually a master's degree. One year later in 1727, we have the Wilkinson manuscript that contains an apparent reference uh, to a very simple version of the same story. So 1726, 1727, we see not just that the master's degree exists, but that it's spreading. Now, with the master's degree for speculative masons, this results in a three-degree system uh, of learning and growth. And it's loosely uh, resonant with the idea of youth, manhood, and age, a degree that imparts, a, a, a talks about a period of time in which you're a novice uh, needing to learn and just absorb and be open uh, uh, to the things that you know you don't know. And a fellow craft degree that's all about activity and adulthood and coming into fruition and, and really being uh, uh, active in the world and trying to apply some of the things you learned as an apprentice. You're starting to build the building, not just shape the stone. And then the master's degree emphasizes mortality and the importance of, of spending your life happily and well. And that by the time you get to old age, if you make it there, you want to enjoy the fact that you had a good life and that it was worth living. And here and now, if you're not quite yet to old age, realizing that today could be your last. So live today as if it is. These are the key lessons that you see early on uh, in these degree systems. Now, again, the originator of the master's degree, like so much of the rest of this, is completely unknown. There's always been plenty of speculation. I've heard speculation about Elias Ashmole being an author. There's no evidence for that. I've heard Isaac Newton tossed out. There's no evidence uh, he was a Freemason. Boy, it would be great if he was. Masons would love to know that, but there's no evidence for it. Francis Bacon, same thing. Boy, it's a good fit. Uh, it seems like something he would write, but there's no proof at all for it. Jean de Seguillet, I mentioned earlier, he was that master of the French Lodge operating in London. He was a deputy grandmaster very early on in the Grand Lodge of England. And grandmaster is a very influential mason and an intelligent man. That case is not a slam dunk, but it's the best I've ever heard. So maybe. But the thing to keep in mind is that the master's degree and its legend are very simple in the beginning. And the evolution and growth of that, the change of it, is organic, just like the change and growth of masonry. And by the way, the operative lodges were slow to adopt it. We see it takes about a century for the Scottish lodges to start to work the master's degree. So this is, appears to be a distinctly um, English phenomenon. Uh, there just an old engraving of Solomon's temple. There you see a master, a symbol. It was actually created by Jeremy Ladd Cross here in the United States uh, in the early 1800s, but it's a symbol associated uh, with the master's degree. Uh, depiction of a broken column. Um, three steps, and that's, that figure is time. A uh, time with the scythe uh, standing at her back, and she's in mourning. So with that, let's get a bit into uh, Freemasonry in the United States. Again, a really vast subject. This is the painting by Alan Cox, that was a muralist. This is a laying of the cornerstone. That's a ceremony we still do. Uh, one just took place in Frisco uh, a week or two ago. Uh, this is laying the cornerstone of the United States Capitol. That's a ceremony in which President uh, uh, George Washington uh, was effectively the, mas the master of the lodge uh, performing that cornerstone leveling. Now, the first Masonic lodge operating in the United States were definitely Scottish. And the Grand Lodge of Scotland has plenty of, of, of proof to that effect. But they were operative lodges. There's no evidence that they initiated any Americans. And when the building was done, because they were building cathedrals and, and public buildings and things, uh, because we needed that in the colonies, then they went back home. And uh, there's Jonathan Belcher is a figure who's born in Boston in 1681. He's initiated as a Mason while traveling in Europe in 1704, and he comes back to Boston in 1705. He's usually given credit as being the first real American uh, Freemason. The first documented lodge building, uh, lodge meeting, takes place at King's Chapel in Boston in 1720. Documented means there's either an announcement in a local paper or there's a minute book that explains what happened there or somebody writes in a journal that they were at lodge. So it's documented history, 1720 in Boston. The first constituted lodge that receives a charter is in Boston, Massachusetts. Uh, and that's the St. John's Lodge, which is meeting at the Bunch of Grapes Tavern and it's constituted in July 30th, 1733, but we know it was operating before that. 
And it's chartered by, uh, at least ostensibly, the Provincial Grand Lodge of New England. And that's a warrant uh, or patent that's given to a fellow by the name of Henry Price uh, at the time by the Grand Lodge of London. But while we know that was chartered in 1733, there's no written records of that lodge. It has no minutes, no, no indication of what they were up to until 1751 in Massachusetts. But that lodge and the Provincial Grand Lodge of New England ultimately finds its way into becoming the Grand Lodge of Massachusetts. Now, I mentioned the first constituted lodge, the first documented lodge meeting. The earliest minute book is from the Tun Savern Lodge, number three. The date of that is June 24th, 1731. That's two years earlier than this lodge was constituted in Massachusetts. Now, the Tun Tavern is in Philadelphia. Anyone associated with the Marine Corps will know that's one of the legendary birthplaces associated with the Corps. Benjamin Franklin mentions this lodge in a, in a record of September 9th, 1731, and he mentions several other lodges operating at the same time. So we know that there were, there were activities going on uh, apart from this, but this is what's documented. This lodge becomes associated with what's known as the Cox Provincial Grand Lodge. There's a warrant again from the Grand Lodge of London given to, da given to Daniel Cox that's effective from the 24th of June, that's St. John's Day, 1731, and it's effective for two years. And probably the province had the authority to elect a new provincial grandmaster at the end of that two-year term. This Cox Provincial Grand Lodge ultimately becomes the Grand Lodge of Pennsylvania. Now, let me say, there is tremendous controversy over who's really first, who's the most legitimate, what was on those warrants when they were really effective, and whose territory was whose, you know, who did Pennsylvania belong to, and so on. And the truth is, I have very good friends who are Masons in Pennsylvania and Massachusetts, and if I say anything beyond that, I'm going to get in trouble. So I'll leave it with you and simply say, history is unsettled as to who really has the claim of primacy in the US in terms of organized Grand Lodges. Now, most of this activity, these are moderns. The ancients are still doing their thing, uh, ultimately in 1751 in England. And they ultimately do charter some lodges over here, but this comes after the establishment of these early Grand Lodges in Massachusetts and Pennsylvania. So these are the moderns, the ones coming out of London that are speculative uh, masons. Let's fast forward a bit, give you a, a little snippet of the Grand Lodge of Texas. <coughs> now, the main thing to take away from this is the nature of history and development of the United States uh, is such that each state has its own Masonic jurisdiction. We don't have a Grand Lodge of the United States. Uh, we have a Grand Lodge for Texas. Grand Lodges represent the leadership of Masonic Lodges within their jurisdiction, and there's no higher organizational authority. Grand Lodge of Texas doesn't report to anybody. Uh, in terms of masonry. But it, you know, there's a loose system of recognition where Grand Lodges agree, yes, you're legitimate, you're doing real masonry, we agree with the way you're doing things, and so we recognize you and our members can visit each other, and so on. That's recognition. The Grand Lodge of Texas, as I said, leads the Masonic Lodges in Texas, and in February 11th of 1828, Stephen F. Austin, you recognize that name, calls a meeting of Masons, because he is one, uh, at San Felipe de Austin to draft a petition uh, for a lodge to the York Grand Lodge of Mexico. We're still part of Mexico at this time. That petition is never answered. In October 1828, the Mexican uh, government makes Freemasonry illegal, and so that effort is abandoned. Now, there's a Masonic meeting later in Texas, March 1835, the legend is it's near an oak tree. That's a picture of it. Um, may have been in a little grove of peach and laurel. But it's near the town of Brazoria. And it's ostensibly for the purpose of establishing a Grand Lodge of Texas. They want to create the Grand Lodge in 1835. And a guy by the name of Anson Jones, might have heard of him, he, he led the effort. He's kind of the appointed the leader. They get dispensation and a charter from the Grand Lodge of Louisiana to establish Holland Lodge number 36 under the jurisdiction of Louisiana. Today we call it Holland Lodge number one. That charter was given to Anson Jones just before the Battle of San Jacinto. Of course, he's the last president of the Republic of Texas. 
By 1837, there are two other lodges chartered by Louisiana in Texas, one in Nacogdoches uh, and the other in St. Augustine. And these lodges, uh, combined with Hallam, met in Houston to establish a Grand Lodge for what is now the Republic of Texas on the 20th of December, 1837. Sam Houston, who was the president of the Republic of Texas at this time, presided over uh, that meeting in the city of Houston. And they elected Anson Jones as the first Grand Master for the Grand Lodge of Texas. They agreed that they would meet a few months later, April 16th of 1838. They do that. And they establish their independence as the Grand Lodge of Texas. And those three lodges become Holland Lodge number one, uh, Milam Lodge number two, and McFarland Lodge number three. So masonry enters uh, Texas. Now, everything I've discussed to this point has, has been what what Masons refer to as the Blue Lodge, these Masonic lodges that confer the first three degrees, apprentice, fellow craft, and master. And while all of these Grand Lodges are being established and the three degrees are being proliferated into the United States, into these Grand Lodge systems and elsewhere, there's something really interesting happening in France. This map shows a few of the key locations, uh, Paris, Miracourt, uh, Bordeaux, especially Lyon, uh, Strasbourg and Metz. What's happening is the, the story of the master's degree is incomplete. And there's a couple of different ways to address that. The Masons uh, in England uh, and, some of the, and the Masons in the United States, for the most part, they complete or expand on the story by making the master's degree more complex. The French Masons create new degrees. So they supplement the story. Their master's degree is quite simple or incomplete. And they add degrees to further elaborate on the story. And that expands because there's a lot of interest in free thought, uh, in liberty and equality and progressive ideas that are happening in France because we're leading up to the French Revolution. American Revolution hasn't quite happened yet, but those philosophical ideas are gestating, especially in France. And so we see those ideas incorporated into Masonic teaching and symbolism in those lodges in these various locations. And what springs up in the growth of all of these degrees originally to complete or add material to the story of the master's degree, they really branch out and become something altogether different. You see the rise of new rights and systems of degrees, and they're really uh, connecting with the Age of Enlightenment, with the Enlightenment ideal. And these rights in France, these degrees, they become known as the hautes grades or the high degrees. They particularly attract the interests of French free thinkers, both religious and political. They're natural scientists, they're scholars, they're philosophers. And this is the origin of that mantra of French Masonic lodges, liberty, equality, fraternity, that we hear again when the French Revolution comes around. Now, the vast majority of these rights and groups ceased to exist almost as soon as they began. But some of the degrees survive. And we have modern organizations in masonry that have inherited some of those. <coughs> But it should be said, these organizations are completely separate in terms of leadership and structure from the Grand Lodges and the lodges conferring those three degrees that I've mentioned up to this point. One example I'll mention again in a bit and will elaborate on is the Scottish Rite. And I mention that and I'm going to get into more detail because most of you will have heard this idea of a 32nd degree Mason, a 33rd degree Mason. Those are Scottish Rite uh, degrees. So those are Masons who decided to join the Scottish Rite and receive those degrees, and they've, they've, they've gone on in that system. That's not connected with the Grand Lodges and the three degree lodges, the, the blue lodges as we call them that I mentioned at this point. Another example is the York Rite, uh, which can, it has a royal arch tradition, probably began, looks like history says it started in the United States uh, in 1750s. Um, and then grafted onto that were additional sets of degrees. A couple of them were side degrees that originally belonged to the Scottish Rite. And then there, within the York Rite at the end, there's a series of chivalric orders, uh, like the Order of Malta and the Order of the Temple, which is where you get Knights Templars associated uh, with masonry in terms of guys who have the swords and the hats and so on and, and wear that sort of regalia. Uh, in masonry, that's the York Rite. And then there's Shriners and so on. There's, there's a lot of organizations that are connected with Masonry simply because in order to join those organizations, you have to be a Master Mason. 
You have to have gone through the three degrees. So now let's dig a little bit into the Scottish Rite specifically. Now you have all of these rites and systems in France that I mentioned that are kind of bubbling and proliferating and, and evolving and changing. Uh, in France in 1743, we have the Grand Lodge. They officially <clears throat> disparage, they complain about guys claiming to be Scots masters. They call them Ecossais. Uh, masters, because they want special privileges in Grand Lodge. And the Grand Lodge of France says, forget that. Then they come back a short time later, pretty much at their next meeting, and they enact those privileges into their Grand Lodge law. Probably what happened is some of the Grand Lodge officers became Scots masters, right? And we don't really, we have some good guesses ceremonially about what was going on in that degree, but it's the first time you hear about Scottish masonry, and it's in France. So while we call this the Scottish Rite, you should understand the degrees themselves are coming from this proliferation of Masonic degrees and rites that I talk about in France. Probably by about 1751 in France, we have about 14 new degree or 14 degrees total, uh, 11 of which are building on the story of the master's degree, organized in something that becomes, uh, that it starts to be called perfect masonry or a lodge of perfection. A few years earlier, there's a guy named Etienne Morin uh, in France. He presided over a lodge called Perfect Harmony uh, and probably others. He was a prominent Mason in France. In 1761, he's granted a patent by the Council of Sublime Princes. We start to get some really interesting and, and um, pompous titles uh, in Masonic systems about this time. Council of Sublime Princes in Bordeaux issue him a charter uh, to confer all of the grades of perfect and sublime masonry anywhere in the world. That's a pretty serious uh, charter. But we know now, I mean, the latest in terms of Masonic scholarship suggests that Morin himself really had a handle, uh, had a hand in uh, organizing and creating many of the degrees that have survived into the Scottish rites. So it's not unusual for them to perhaps grant him a charter to that effect. And he goes to Santo Domingo, French territories, the French West Indies in 1764 and establishes a lodge of perfection there and starts working his system of degrees. By about this time we know, or at least by 1771, we know that there are 25 degrees in the right that he's uh, offering. The final degree is uh, Sublime Prince of the Royal Secret, so it's kind of loosely called the Order of the Royal Secret. The first three degrees are Apprentice, Fellow, Craft, and Master, and then there are 22 degrees uh, in addition to that. He established lodges that do this in Jamaica in 1770. He initiates other men, gives them similar organizational authority who go on uh, to establish uh, the rights of these degrees in New York and South Carolina uh, and so on. Other bodies established all the way through 1790. By this time, Marin is dead. His inheritors, his students, his successors are passing this on, but it's a bit of chaos. There's kind of an organizational looseness. There's no, there's no one kind of authority uh, to control this. And frankly, a lot of the guys who, who receive the authority to confer these degrees are more interested in the money they'll receive from the men who are taking the degrees. And so it's, it's, it's kind of getting out of hand. It no longer really starts to respect the tradition or probably the vision that Etienne Morin had. This culminates in May 31st of 1801 in Charleston, South Carolina, when nine men who are initiates of this system of degrees that came from Morin and in France say, all right, rather than 25 degrees, we're going to have 32 and we're going to call it the ancient accepted Scottish rite. They establish the nine of them uh, constitute the first Supreme Council, which is the governing body uh, over the Scottish rite uh, only, the Scottish rite degrees. And they reserve what they call the 33rd degree for the members of that Supreme Council, the nine men who are administrators or leaders of the Scottish rite. That body in South Carolina refers itself to itself today as the Mother Supreme Council because what this Scottish Rite, which really comes from France, is established formally in the United States in Charleston, South Carolina in 1801. We then export it back uh, to France and to England and eventually Scotland. Um, and that's the story uh, of the Scottish Rite. And that's where you get the 32nd degree and the 33rd degree we can get into some detail of that, but I want to clarify, 
Uh, the Supreme Council is now much larger. The members of the Supreme Council are the state leaders uh, for uh, the Scottish Rite. So we have, uh, we have a man who's in charge of the Scottish Rite, his name is Doug Atkins, here, here in Texas. And he's a member of that Supreme Council for the Southern jurisdiction, which is every state west of the Mississippi and south of the Ohio River. It's most of the United States. And that's the original Supreme Council. But a lot of Masons, you'll hear a 33rd degree Masons, and that's because it's an honorarium. It's really an honor that's conferred on Scottish Rite Masons uh, who have uh, uh, turned in or you know, who, who exemplify the ideals of the fraternity and have, who, who have done things that have really served the fraternity and their community for many, many, many years. So it's sort of like a, a, a peer recognition that, hey, you know, you, you really get this Scottish Rite masonry thing and you're doing it. Uh, and you're sincere about it. And so when you hear the, uh, someone is a 33rd degree or they'll say a 33rd degree honorary, they've received that honor. But again, all of that's within the context of the Scottish Rite. All right, really quickly, I gotta talk about anti-Masonry. The ideas we've talked about, liberty, equality, tolerance, freedom of thought, freedom of conscience, freedom of expression, uh, restrictions, um, perhaps, or, or uh, that's in, especially in, Freemason, in French Freemasonry, restrictions on the collusion of church and state. Those are radical ideas at the time they remain so today, and as a result, Masonic lodges and Freemasons represent a threat uh, to those who find those ideas dangerous. That's, that's just the reality. You know, Freemasons were persecuted and killed by the Nazis when Hitler came to power. Uh, they were interrogated and in more than a few cases killed by the Vichy government uh, during the, the Nazi occupation of France. Uh, in the Islamic world, there are conspiracy theorists, conspiracy-minded Muslims uh, who equate Freemasonry with Zionism, and similarly, uh, persecute Muslims who are Freemasons. There are voices within Christian fundamentalism that object to the tolerance and acceptance of those of other faiths, or they claim that Freemasonry is some vast occult conspiracy uh, or a cabal to bring about a new world order. Um, you know, and if your faith prohibits friendship with those who disagree with you, uh, then Masonry probably isn't a good fit for you. Um, and others still equate Freemasonry with the Bavarian Illuminati or, or some alleged continuation of them. I'm going to recommend a book to that effect, by the way, that's a good source of material on the real Illuminati, uh, if you want to know. Um, but that doesn't show up on television. At least it hasn't yet. <laughs> now, I don't have time to express every aspect or talk about every aspect of anti-Masonry, but I want to touch on a few quickly. The first is the Morgan Affair. William Morgan was born in Virginia. This is about 1774, just before the Revolution. He may have served as a captain during the War of 1812. They call him Captain William Morgan later. There's no record to prove uh, that he served uh, or served in that rank, but it may very well have been the case. Uh, he's married in 1819. He moves his family to Canada. He operates a brewery there and then loses almost everything uh, in a fire. Becomes destitute, settles in Batavia for a while uh, in New York, which is a relatively small community, and he works as a brick mason. He claims to have been initiated while he's in Canada as a mason, and he goes to lodges uh, in New York and other, in order to be received as a visitor, especially in Rochester. And the local Masons, for whatever reason, are suspicious of his claim to membership. They're suspicious of his character. There are some contemporary claims that he might have been prone to gambling or drinking, uh, may have been a serious debtor. Um, but Morgan, about this time, claims to have been contacted by David Cade Miller, who's an EA with a lodge in Batavia, and he was denied advancement to the subsequent degrees. He's, got, he's a little bitter about Masonry. And he's a new, uh, newspaper editor, and he gives an advance, at least this is the suggestion, he gives an advance to uh, Morgan to write a book that will be called The Illustrations of Masonry as an exposure of all the Masonic uh, ritual or ceremony and, and his criticism of Freemasonry. Now, as an aside, I should say, there have been exposures of Masonic ritual uh, since the 1730s. I mean, almost as old as the master's degree. We couldn't keep the secret really more than four or five years before people started writing about it. So there's nothing really threatening in what Morgan is offering. However, uh, guys who either didn't like uh, Morgan or were suspicious of this or didn't want that book published 
they land him in debtor's prison for a debt of $2.68, uh, which may or may not have been the case. And that debt's almost immediately paid, and he's released to a group of men with a coach. And there's a suggestion that maybe Morgan didn't want to go with him. Now, there's a lot of different versions and stories about what happened. Some say Morgan was drowned in the Niagara River, or that he was paid to leave town, that he was kidnapped and taken to Canada. Morgan's body actually was never found. But there was the body of another man who turned out to be Timothy Monroe, who was fished out of the river. And the idea that that body, before it was identified, might have been Morgan, uh, lit the story on fire. And conspiracy was presumed. And so the sheriff, who was also a mason in the town, was removed from office and jailed for conspiracy and kidnapping. Three other masons were convicted and served time for kidnapping. Um, and I'll tell you, modern scholarship is pretty well satisfied that, that, who, that Morgan probably was killed. But it's not definitive. But the story of this and the idea of conspiracy, the idea that Morgan's body had been found and he had been so harshly treated even though his body wasn't found, was enough to ignite interest in getting rid of masonry to the extent that you have what's known as the anti-Masonic party. Really, this is established by men who were opposed to Andrew Jackson, uh, who was running for president at this time and was a well-known to be a Mason and spoke well of Masonry publicly at the time. Now, the truth with Morgan is that in the end, sometimes corrupt men make terrible decisions and do corrupt and bad uh, things. But the idea of this conspiracy or a systemic corruption in Freemasonry caught the public imagination, especially in New England. And then religious groups began to pile on, the Quakers, the Lutherans, Mennonites, German Reformed Church, who don't like the idea of taking promises. And Masons do make promises to each other when we go through the degrees. You have leaders, ministers, pastors of other faiths that condemn Freemasonry in one way or another, especially the Presbyterians, the Methodists, and the Baptists at this time. And there's an overall perception of elitism, because at least in this part of the country, it's not really true outside of New England at this time, but in this part of the country, Masons are physicians and lawyers and businessmen. They really are social uh, and economic elite. There's a guy named Thurlow Weed, who's a newspaper, a New York newspaper uh, 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 man, and he's highly influential. Eventually, he's politically influential now, but eventually in the Whig and the Republican parties. And he's an opponent of Jackson, especially because he likes John Quincy Adams. And he is really instrumental in establishing this anti-Masonic party, whose stated purpose was really to obliterate Freemasonry in the United States. It was formed in New York in February of 1828. There's really no question, I think, it's pretty objective to say that it was nothing more than political opportunism. These guys saw the public interest in, the, in, in, the, in, in anger toward Freemasonry, and they wanted to get rid of Jackson. And this was a convenient way to do that. So they, uh, they run a candidate for New York governor. He loses, but they did become uh, the primary opposition in a handful of state legislators. Uh, because they're an opposition party with numbers in these state legislatures, they're able to get and influence the appointment of senators uh, who are elected by the state legislatures at this time in the U.S. Senate. In 1832, there's even a presidential candidate, William Wirt. He's pictured there on the left. Um, he won a little more than 7% of the popular vote. And he won the electors for the state of Vermont. Vermont was heavily into the anti-Masonic party, uh, probably more than any other state. But by 1836, the members of the anti-Masonic party start to disagree. There's internal uh, you know, disagreement, condescension, and, or dissension. And by 1840, 1840 the party really uh, ceases to be. But the damage to Masonry is, is done. Uh, during this time, some states enact laws that make masonry illegal. Lodges go dark. They shut down. Uh, in New York, about 75% of the lodges that were chartered uh, within a few years demise. Then there's something called the Humanum Genus. I'll mention briefly. Uh, this is a papal encyclical uh, in 1884, Pope Leo XIII, who's pictured here. Um, his papacy runs from 1878 to 1903. In 1884, he issues an encyclical called the Humanum Genus. And he flags, he identifies Freemasonry as the great perpetrators of several ideas that he sees as uh, dangerous and, and ideas that he equates uh, with the, the, the city of, or the kingdom of evil uh, in St. Augustine's work. Uh, 
He says that uh, at every period of time, each has been in conflict with the other, the, the, uh, the, the kingdom of, of light or the kingdom of good and the kingdom of evil. With a variety and multiplicity of weapons and warfare, although not always with equal ardor and assault. At this period, however, the partisans of evil seem to be combining together and to be struggling with united vehemence, led on or assisted by the strongly organized and widespread association called the Freemasons. And he goes on to condemn specifically the ideas that Freemasons are spreading. And I'll paraphrase, but I'm not, I mean, go read the Humanum Genus. The ideas that he's criticizing are uh, that the authority of the church and the authority of the state should be separate. He criticizes the idea that there should be public education for all, independent of religious instruction. He says that the Freemasons say wrongly that all men have the same right, this is a quote, and are in every respect of equal and like condition that each one is naturally free, that no one has the right to command another. Pope Leo XIII disagreed. He says that Freemasons say that all things belong to free people. Power is held by the command or permission of the people so that when the popular will changes, rulers may be lawfully disposed. And he finds that abhorrent. And so he condemns Freemasonry for this in the papal, papal encyclical. This is not the first a blow to Freemasonry within the church, or not the, not the last, but it is the first. Uh, and, and so we find ourselves in a state uh, today uh, where Catholics uh, who happen, who are Masons are, are generally, if that's known, they're denied uh, communion. But at no time in history has Masonry ever prevented Catholics from joining. Uh, so it's kind of an odd circumstance. Um, I'll mention Leo Taxel real briefly because it comes up in the literature. I'll do my best to hurry, sorry. Um, Leo Taxel is a hoaxer. He's a well-known sort of trickster in France these days. He feigned a conversion to Roman Catholicism, but he didn't like the church. And he published, he, he, he pro proclaimed publicly after this conversion his intention to undo previous damage he had caused in attacking the church, uh, church and the Pope in his work. And he published a four-volume history of Freemasonry, and it contains very detailed but entirely fictitious accounts of Masonic uh, rituals and ceremonies that he intended to appear satanic in character. He fabricated in these books correspondence between well-known Masonic leaders at the time, uh, you know, saying some, some things about, uh, about, um, about these ceremonies and, and conspiracies. He collaborated on a second book called The Devil in the 19th Century, which again was very detailed and again fictitious accounts of a character named Diana Vaughn, uh, who was a figure he invented who, who said that uh, uh, she had been involved in this satanic masonry. And the book details her peculiar adventures with all sorts of demons. But by some in, uh, inspiration, she says she invokes the name of Joan the Ark and the demons disperse. And so uh, it's under this name, through this figure of Diana Vaughn, Taxel publishes a book of prayers um, called Eucharistic Novena, uh, inspired by this experience invoking Joan of Arc. And that book received praise from the Pope himself. But, and this is important, on April 19th, 1897, Taxel calls a press conference and he tells everybody Diana Vaughn's going to be here. So. Catholics are there. There's some Freemasons in the audience interested to see what's going on, too, because they don't understand these books he's written. And he confesses. He says, none of this is true, and my intention was to discredit both the Catholic Church and Freemasonry. Ha-ha! <laughs> the problem is, subsequent authors... Uh, particularly within some segments of, of Christianity that have been very hard on masonry, found the work of Leo Taxel but didn't know the confession. They didn't know it was an admitted hoax, that it was a trick. And so they took his material and presented it as fact. And that subsequently gets quoted and borrowed and quoted. And, and I mean, you know, this is how Wikipedia works. As if it's in a book, you can cite it, then it must be true, right? 
So that's Leo Taxel. And his stuff continues to come up, especially around this man, Albert Pike. Interesting figure. If there's any questions, we can go into depth about him. Albert Pike, he's alleged to be, you know, the Pope of Freemasonry or that he wrote the Bible of Freemasonry, some of these ridiculous things. And in Taxel's books, he's got some crazy correspondence that he attributes to Pike because he was so, so well known. You know, Pike was a scholar. Uh, he knew several languages, French, Latin, uh, Greek, uh, Greek, Hebrew. He studied Sanskrit so he could do his own translation of the Vedic poems uh, in his 80s. Pike is a figure in the Scottish Rite specifically, although he was really involved in all aspects of Masonry uh, in many ways. He leaves his imprimatur on the Scottish Rite uh, and its degree system, and he creates lectures. He's most well known for a book which is the most misunderstood and misquoted book in all of Masonry, which is called Morals and Dogma, uh, published in 1871. Uh, that book you can find everywhere because there was a time when every Scottish Rite Mason received a copy and none of them were capable of reading it because you get to the first page and it's like, you know, it's so dense. And so a lot of them end up for sale. So they're everywhere. You can walk into half price books and find at least a couple copies. But it's, it's hard to understand. Pike is brilliant, but his language is dense. He's writing uh, kind of in Victorian English, he assumes you have an expertise in classical history, that you know a little Greek, you know a little Hebrew. Um, and so it's hard to, it's hard to understand. Uh, but Pike uh, influences the Scottish Rite degrees to the extent that he adds a lot of lecture material. And he provides a philosophical and intellectual framework of study uh, for Scottish Rite Masons who go through the degrees and are interested in the symbolism and its relationship uh, to the grand sort of philosophical and religious uh, and social ideas that have existed throughout time. Morals and Dogma is legitimately the first book in the English language on the subject of comparative religion. And Pike was probably the most qualified to write that book in his time. Fascinating read. A couple of final thoughts and then to the extent we have time and I'll hang back late of course with questions if you don't want to ask publicly. Look, masonry has always been controversial. The ideas that it promotes individual freedom in terms of government as well as religion have never been welcomed uh, by established religious and political authority. Masonry has had among its members several great and famous heroes, and we've had a few scoundrels. But Freemasonry didn't put any of those men in positions or powers of leadership. Now, it's often been true that men who are capable of great things are interested in Freemasonry. But that's the reason they're Masons, just not the other way around. They're mostly, Masons are just ordinary men from all walks of life and they're trying to be better men. And their detractors have gone to great lengths to condemn the fraternity and Masons. And for the most part, Masons go about their business and ignore them. But Masonry persists in the idea that if we disagree, that's okay because most people are well-intended and it's worth trying to get along. And Masons recognize that we learn new things through opposition and disagreement. We have to be open to being wrong in order to learn or experience something new. And this is really important. If we work together, we can accomplish great things. Masonry suggests it's better to be part of something bigger than yourself. So I apologize, I ran a few minutes late, but I, I do wanna open up to, to any questions you have. That's the material I have this evening. When, when the Pope uh, gave his edict about masonry, <clears throat> I've always understood that the, there were so many Catholics in masonry that then the Knights of Columbus was formed. Is that true? Well, I, I think there's some truth to that. I can't speak. I don't like podiums, but I'll come back to here if I have to. So I don't. I can't speak with authority on the history of Knights Columbus, but I'm certainly sure that there were Masons uh, who were Catholic at the time who were who felt strongly about their adherence to the Catholic faith and would have done whatever was necessary. Uh, to, to do what the Pope wanted them to do and would have renounced their membership in Masonry. At that time, it's shortly thereafter, of course, the Knights of Columbus do come into existence. And it seems pretty clear that a man who enjoyed what he was doing with Freemasonry would probably like the sort of things that the Knights of Columbus were up to because they're very similar 
just very Catholic and of course, uh, you know, allowed within the faith. But certainly the truth is there are, Mas- there are Catholics who are Masons today. They just, you know, they do their own thing. Uh, briefly, I missed over the, the tie. King Solomon's temple. Yes. What was, again, what was significant, significant that to early masonry? That's a good question. Um, can you hear me? I, I'll stay over here. Okay. Stay there. All right. So, okay. Oh, hey. Technology is a good thing. I'm an electrical engineer. I should have noticed that. Um, <laughs> So in early documentation, like the old charges uh, that I mentioned, the 15th, 16th, 17th century, actually Solomon's temple is inconsequential. Uh, I don't think that it's ever really mentioned uh, in the old documentation. What seems to fascinate Masons who want, and their legendary history of Masonry, you'll see tied uh, more often actually to the Tower of Babel, the Tower of Babel story as this great construction or public works project, even though the outcome was questionable. Um, or the intention. It's really with the emergence of the master's degree where you start to have an interest in Solomon's temple. And any reasons I could give you for that would be speculative, except that uh, we know that the story in connection with the master's degree and the construction uh, of the temple uh, in and of itself sort of inseparably linked speculative masonry, not the operative tradition of the craft, but speculative masonry, uh, to Solomon and to the temple. And so there are symbols that pre-existed the emergence of the master's degree tradition. There are symbols associated with the apprentice degree, for example, that then get to have explanations associated with Solomon and that period of construction. And so the symbolism evolves and changes. It's just part of that organic growth. And I can't tell you why, because we don't really know uh, what the impetus for it was or who did it, except the, uh, the idea of the Tower of Babel sort of fades, although it pops up in one of the degrees in the, the old degrees in the Scottish Rite uh, that was worked that way until the early 1900s. Um, but uh, Solomon's Temple begins to be far more important uh, as kind of this great edifice or this representation of a great spiritual edifice, not of a religious tradition that all Masons belong to, but as an example of men who are trying to build godly lives or lives that are an expression of what God means to them. And so in terms of the symbolism, the Temple of Solomon is a far better fit for that than the Tower of Babel. That makes sense? Yeah, two questions. Um, Early on, you mentioned the three requirements for Masonry. Yes. I only you uh, I I only heard two. Maybe I missed the third. One was to um, it was on your own initiative. You do, you weren't invited, and also then you had to have some concept or adherence to the concept of a deity. Oh, I'm sorry. Third, I didn't mention. You're right. I guess I did say there's three. Uh, I probably left it on my notes. But the third general requirement that's almost universal in Mesa, well, it really is universal. This one in particular uh, is that you have to be a man of good character. So you're expected to be a man of good character. You have to be able to express that you have some sort of spiritual viewpoint, some sort of spiritual framework uh, or foundation in your life. And you have to do it of your own free will. And um, then, okay, the, even the term Freemason, mm-hmm. uh, as opposed to a captive Mason. Um, <laughs> um, and then also were there like um, efforts to come out of other guilds or con- confraternities such as carpenters, millwrights, plumbers, whatever? Sure, sure. Um, yes, uh, so the first question, free. The, the easiest explanation for the word free in terms of Freemason is an operative explanation. And the idea that is, is unlike other trades where you know a smith, for example, would, would, would perform his trade in a community for the entirety of his life. But a stonemason who's building a cathedral, uh, when the cathedral's done, there's, you don't need another cathedral. And so the stonemason has to have the liberty to travel across uh, territorial boundaries, you know, from one town to the next, uh, or even you know, occasionally perhaps from one nation to the next or one kingdom to the next. And uh, that was simply not have been necessarily permissible uh, in the Middle Ages uh, for a typical tradesman. 
Uh, but then, you know, by the time you get to France and speculative masonry, which is really probably the first place the, the word appears, <laughs> it's kind of an odd thing, but franc, franc maçon was probably the earliest form of it in French that may have been the source of the word Freemason as a single word in terms of the speculative craft. Um, but uh, that might have had a more symbolic sense of, of a more free thinking uh, or liberated uh, individual, but you know that's that's speculation. But there is an operative tradition around the word free. The other question was the other trades. You know, I, I can't claim expertise, but I've certainly read uh, papers and works that talk about the other trades uh, doing a similar thing, having a sort of speculative uh, moral uh, teaching. Uh, associated with that, and certainly in the, uh, uh, especially in the late 1800s, early 1900s, when you had the proliferation of lots of these social and civic organizations, just as Freemasonry tied itself to Masonry, you had a lot of organizations tie themselves to earlier uh, trades as well. But the direct connection probably is is a little more tenuous there. I don't know, can't speak with authority. But certainly the other trades were doing it. Since Tom hasn't taken the mic away, I'll ask one more quick question. Sure. Um, got other questions. <laughs> you might have already answered this question partially, but is there any connection between the woodmen of the world and the uh, Freemasons? Well, there were men who were members of both, uh, but organizationally, not really. Um, the, uh, it was a different sort of organization, the Woodmen of the World, and they had kind of a different purpose. Uh, masonry has its own woodworking uh, group, the Tall Cedars of Lebanon, which are associated with the cedar trees that were used in the construction of Solomon's Temple, is its kind of wood-focused uh, group. We don't really have that in Texas, I don't think, but uh, it is in other places in the country and the world. But no, they were different organizations, but a lot of men, I know I have family uh, that were certainly both but not related directly. Yes, ma'am. Do you admit women? Good question. Uh, I, uh, I'm part of what we would generally think of as, as uh, historically mainstream masonry. And Grand Lodges in our traditions do not. It's a tradition that's just for men. Uh, there are other traditions of masonry and we don't enter visit but you know they're free to do their own thing. Uh, feminine masonry has been very active in England and, and in continental Europe for over a century. Uh, we have all kinds of records of women for one reason or another who were actually initiated as masons even in the United States. Uh, there's a great author, Karen Kidd, and I can't remember the name of the book, uh, but she has all kinds of documentation in there about women who were initiated as masons under various circumstances, sometimes because they happened to see the ceremony anyway and they didn't know what else to do. Uh, sometimes they wanted to communicate the, the degree to a wife so that when they went to war, like in the Civil War, that she would know something to say so that Masons in the opposing army would take care of her, for example, if necessary, that sort of thing. Uh, but in the United States, there are active, uh, what they call co-Masonic groups. I'm not aware of any uh, uh, feminine Masonic organizations, but there are co-Masonic groups that are for both men and women. Tell them about the Rainbow Girls. <laughs> well, we do have uh, Rainbow Girls as a youth organization for girls within Masonry. And there are, there are, Yes. Eastern Star. And well, yeah, and there are Masonic bodies uh, for which uh, women connected with Freemasons can join. Eastern Star is an example of that. If you're a wife, widow, mother, sister, or daughter of a Mason, you can join that. Um, there are a few other bodies associated with some of the other organizations like the York Rite and the Shrine and so on, uh, similar. But in terms of those three degrees, apprentice, fellow, craft, and master, uh, women could find that within either a feminine Masonic tradition or a co-Masonic tradition, but that's not mine. Does that answer your question? Uh, I, w I wanted to ask a question about uh, burial. Uh, would there be a situation where Masons would uh, take a body and then have a, bur a burial ceremony, but yet have the body in an unmarked grave? Um, okay, well, there is, I didn't, I didn't mention it, but there are various forms of Masonic burial services that connects directly with the symbolism of the master's degree and the aspects of mortality uh, connected with that. That ceremony, as it's been worked in the United States, there's several different forms of it. That's done either at the graveside or during the service in front of the family and everyone. Not, 
I've never encountered anything that would involve an unmarked grave or being unknown. There have been plenty of prominent Masons. Pike was one, for example. Albert Pike wanted to be in an unmarked grave and he was just so important that they had to give him a, a stone and an epitaph and he didn't, I'm sure he wouldn't have liked that. Um, but while there have been variants in Masonic services, I'm not aware of anything that would have been done with, I'll mention one exception, anything that would have been done when the family wasn't present and certainly nothing that would specifically involve an unmarked grave. There is an old funeral service that's not conferred anymore. And to my knowledge in this country, it hasn't been done uh, in about 75 years. Albert Pike, this was his burial service and he was really the one who, he said he translated it from some old French manuscripts. And, the, and that's a burial, that's a, that's a funeral service, not a burial, that would be done the night before the funeral with the family. And only Masons were allowed to be there for that. And the reason was he was doing some things that non-Masons really wouldn't understand because they hadn't seen the Scottish Rite degrees. But that's a very uh, rare and unusual thing and it's, it's just never done anymore. But again, even in that condition, you're talking about something that was done before the main burial service, okay? By the way, I encourage you all to go through the Allen Cemetery. You'll see a lot of women of the world and Masonic stones. That's true. And Plano Mutual Cemetery. I'm, I'm from Plano, so. Uh, my question is about the Texas soldiers uh, mm -hmm. during the Civil War that yes. were in Arkansas. And I have read that there were Masonic meetings that were going on in the encampments. Yes. And can you briefly discuss that and talk, talk about how you would reconcile the... Um, thinking of the Mas the Masons and the war and... <laughs> That's a good question. Oh, and a complicated one. Yes. Um, so let me say first, uh, I don't, as a modern 21st century Mason, I don't find a way to reconcile the teachings of Freemasonry with things like slavery and racism and segregation and all that kind of stuff. I can't put myself in the mindset of someone born in a different place and time to know how they did that. And I wouldn't judge them necessarily. I can only say that I don't understand it now, how they put the two of those together. But it's clear that there were Masons on both sides of the conflict in the Civil War. There are all kinds of documented evidence. There's whole books devoted to this subject um, of, of circumstances where Masons crossed, uh, crossed the boundaries of battle, I should say, and breached, breached the protocol uh, in order to help one another or to help the families of one another. There's instances where uh, funeral services were conferred on soldiers and in order to get enough Masons together to do it, they would get Masons from both sides of the battle. Um, so that was happening. Every time there's been a conflict, this was true in the American Revolution and 1812, War of 1812, and certainly in the Civil War as well. Uh, there were a lot of soldiers who uh, either were Masons going into the war or who were interested in Masonry. And so it's a very common occurrence uh, in the midst of warfare for there to be military lodges. They may not have charters, they may not have anything official, but the, 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 the tradition tells us if you can find seven Masons, you can open a lodge. <laughs> and so, uh, even though the Grand Lodges probably wouldn't like that, the truth is under circumstances of something like the Civil War, it, happens all the, it happened all the time. And there were Masons, who, you know, men who were made Masons in a military context, that happened in the case of my family. So it's absolutely a common occurrence. Uh, I'm sure Google can assist you. I wish I could remember some of the names of the books off the top of my head, uh, but there are good books on this subject. Uh, you can, of course, you can read Revolutionary Brotherhood. I think I mentioned up there in terms of the, the uh, American Revolution. There were good books on the Civil War, too, and I can't remember them right now. I, I apologize. But that absolutely did happen. Fair enough. Back here. Hey, Kevin. My question was more about the operational Masons. Mm -hmm. When you were discussing that you had the three degrees, the first degree and the second degree made perfect sense, and then they started into the third degree. Do you feel they had a need to develop morals because of the age of the initiative you know the the young men that they were bringing in what was the age of these apprentices that they felt they needed to teach morals on top of okay. the trade that's a fair question so let me there's two aspects of that so let me separate the master's degree first because there's no historical evidence that the operative stonemasons 
ever had the master's degree. It props up really in England with the speculative lodges, and then it finds its way back into some of the operative traditions and into Scotland, but not all of them. So let's separate that. In terms of apprenticeship, uh, you know, this was a time when if a family didn't have much money, you know, you send one kid off to the priesthood, you know, maybe one, one kid takes care of the homestead that you have, and then what do you do with the other boys? And one of the things you could do if you couldn't take care of them was you could find a way to apprentice them to a trade. And that was great because then he would have his own livelihood, he wouldn't depend on your homestead, and he might have a better life than you did, actually. And so, really, you had probably boys coming in as apprentices to operative stonemasons lodges young. I mean, really young, certainly by modern standards. And the traditional period of apprenticeship was, was about seven years. You could probably imagine that he would be maybe ready to become a fellow of the craft, maybe 17 years old, 18 years old, probably, if not a little bit younger. Um, and so you're in a time where that's an age where you don't have public education in an organized way. You do have religious instruction. And of course, these trades had laws, that, you know, rules and regulations that required you to go to mass and, and so on on a regular basis and celebrate the feasts. So they would get religious instruction, but they needed, uh, they needed the sort of instruction that would come from a dad, I guess, you know, for lack of a better way of putting that. You know, it, when, the, when the rubber hits the road in life, how do you make moral decisions? How do you, how do you overcome, you know, maybe your tendency to make bad decisions? And that's the sort of instruction that they were doing. And, and they reached for probably what was at hand, which were these working tools and the trade. And it was a, a perfect way to kind of illustrate those lessons. You mentioned um, uh, a few times the reference to free thinkers. Yeah. Um, were they part, uh, that uh, tradition or whatever, part of uh, the, the uh, Freemason uh, development? Um, and if, if so, uh, though, were those reference to free thinkers different than the modern reference to free thinkers? Because they're typically part of an atheistic tradition. And, well, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's a fair question. So, uh, yes, I, I, I should say I mean free thought, free, free thinking in terms of 18th century uh, Europe. Uh, you know, Anderson's constitutions for the vast majority of, of jurisdictions in the world uh, still hold true. Uh, he used the word stupid atheist. I wouldn't do that. Uh, but a stupid atheist or an irreligious libertine. And I think probably what you're asking about in terms of free thought would be closer to what Anderson would have meant as a libertine. Someone who simply is amoral, uh, doesn't, doesn't have any sense of direction or guidance of right and wrong. Um, that's not what I'm intending. When I so was saying free thinking, uh, in terms of 18th century France, I'm talking about someone who is into and interested in ideas of the emergent uh, kind of, you know, laissez-faire, freedom, equality, social contract uh, sort of philosophies that were kind of gestating at that period of time. Kevin, has anybody told you you look like Albert Pack? Oh, Albert hey. Pack. <laughs> Yeah, and I can, tell you, a, I can I, tell you this, you're just as smart as he is. Oh, no, I don't know about that. Any fat man with a beard, and there's a reason I tie this up in a ponytail, because if I go to the Scottish Rite with, that, with my hair down, I, I hear that to no end. I mean, they just, they'll never let it go. The uh, um, final question for me. Anybody else have any questions? Um, I've read over the years there's a special relationship between Jewish people and masonry. Can you describe that? Well, that's an interesting question. So uh, there's a couple of ways to answer that. Uh, first of all, I should say that in terms of the operative tradition, masons were Catholic, right? It's, it's only in the speculative tradition, and it's really with Anderson's constitution when he says all the, you know, they should practice what all good men can agree to. Uh, to be men of honor and live with integrity and truth and so on, honesty. That's the moment in time at which, uh, you know, the speculative Masons are saying, we want men of other faiths uh, to be part of Freemasonry. And it starts almost immediately, uh, especially with the Jewish communities being invited in uh, and certainly other men who, who wouldn't have fallen into particular religious categories um, at the time. 
In terms of a special relationship, uh, the obvious connection is with the importance of the Temple of Solomon uh, in uh, the structure of the master's degree and especially within the Scottish Rite degrees uh, and the continuation of that story. The other thing I will say, and this is, this is true in the earliest form of the French degrees, um, you can find elements of, of Jewish mysticism uh, that falls under the broader umbrella of Kabbalah. You can find elements of that in some of these French degrees that find their way into the Scottish Rite. And so we have uh, many sincere uh, Jewish men who study those traditions within the Jewish faith who are fascinated by the fact that there are elements of that in some of the Scottish Rite degrees today. Um, what about the Inquisition? Uh, did it help form a relationship between Masonry and Judaism? Um, I think the timing and the place is wrong. Uh, for that to have been a major factor. There certainly were divisions uh, at times between the Protestants and the Jewish communities or the Catholics and the Jewish communities. For the most part, uh, Freemasonry seems to do its thing independent of that. Uh, and, you know, it, it, and like I said, the timing of the Inquisition, although it continued on for a long period of time, I think really by the time uh, Freemasonry emerges in the forms that you start to see it in France and, and elsewhere in the world. Um, by that time, the power of the church has waned and the ideas of, of the things like we associate with the Inquisition, that time has really passed. Yeah.